the agenda there was something else that we were going to add to that you were bringing but a warned me of. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. I got a bunch of things. Yeah. Do I need to open up and should have not called this in? I could have let everybody check. Did you, I had the report that you saw that we have right? some questions that you know, Frank he's going to do it all over. No, it was something that had to be written in because it was I much better when I said like something I had attention. Approve the agenda and the minutes? And the agenda. Yes, the agenda and the warrants. So moved. Second. And we're still waiting. I was looking down to see Todd. Okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. This is going to be one of those meetings. <laughs> All right. So I think we should do the folks that are here recognize. Start on this side, perhaps. Do you have anything oh. just here for fun? Just here to see what you're doing. Good. Welcome. We'll come around. You want to introduce yourselves and where you're from? Oh, sure. My name is Tracy Benet Perrin. I'm the school counselor at Green Street School. And I just got back from winter sports five <laughs> minutes ago. Did you ski here? I no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but just came from Mount Snow. Oh, Hi. My name is Jody Metelke. I'm the Family Engagement and Educational Coordinator at Academy School, also known as a social worker, a little easier. <laughs> and I'm Catherine Mason, the school counselor at Oak Grove School. Judith Palmieri, school counselor at Academy. Thank you all for coming you. tonight, especially right off the mountain. <laughs> Hear from you. All right. So I think then we'll jump right into the report. Andy, you're on the end. We, oh, do we need no? to approve the minutes? Oh, we didn't approve. I we, we did not include the minutes. No, we just did the agenda and the, the, agenda uh, and the warrants. warrants. Then we, I so moved we approve the minutes from the meeting of January the 18th. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. So there we are. Okay. Move these people up. Are we on the agenda? So, yeah, we can do that. And if you don't mind, I'm going to take back what I said to you and we'll start with their reports. Right. Yes, I prefer that. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and... Okay, well, I'll um, start by introducing Jody Natalki, who is our social worker. Um, I just want to uh, share a little bit with you about um, the difference, the differences between social worker and a counselor. In, in all three schools, we have school counselors, and we've had them for many years. At one time, they were called guidance counselors. Um, commonly referred to today as school counselors. And um, we also have uh, clinicians, and clinicians work in each of the buildings, there's one in each school, and uh, those folks um, are work for HCRS, and we do a cost share um, for their, their salary. And they do, um, they do more therapeutic work with us students. Um, and then we have starting last year at Academy, a social worker, and the person at Jody. Um, and there's a lot of overlap in terms of what, 
what our, our folks do, but there's a major difference between the counselors, the clinician, and, and the social worker, and that both the counselors and clinician, clinicians work uh, primarily, primarily with students, um, whereas the social worker, Jody, works primarily with, with families and, and parents. Um, and just to share with you a little bit of, or help you to remember how the position came about, um, about a year and a half or so ago, two years ago, the state had uh, Title I school improvement money, and um, we all three schools qualified for, um, for some money that was um, guaranteed for one year, possibility for year two, slim possibility for year three. And at that time, we prioritized what our needs were at Academy, and we felt that the social worker position to work with families was our, our greatest need that could be accommodated through the grant. And um, the, the grant paid for the position for, for that school year um, in this school year. The, the grant, however, is, as you know, um, no longer available to us, and um, Jody's position for next year is in the school budget. So uh, at this time, I want to welcome Jody. Yes, and thanks for having me. Um, the question of what my role is has come up. Like, what do I do? So this is an opportunity to share that. So my role as the Academy School Social Worker mainly connects our school, our community resources, and our families. And the goal is to enhance students' academic, social, and emotional successes. Education improves children's chances and abilities for positive and productive futures. Insecure housing, insecure food, along with mental health issues, substance abuse, and addiction, create stress and conditions that take away from the children's optimal abilities in their learning environment. My role is to help parents reduce their own stressors by supporting them and or directing them to the community resources. Family conditions are community conditions. Low socioeconomic status, housing and food insecurities, mental illness, addiction, single in incomes, subsidized housing. And in my role, I provide the outreach from the school into the community with the families. So another question that often comes up is how do I get the referrals? How do I find them? the families. So one way I get referrals is through the academy, faculty, and, and the administration that there's some type of concern for the student for their well-being. Um, there's also um, in our school different programs. There's staff from the STEP program, the planning room, the counseling and health services. They also let me know that they're becoming concerned about situations that families, that these families might benefit with more assistance outside the school instead of in the school. And that's a large part of my role, being able to get out of the school and beyond just the student. And so my ability to get out and interface with the family and the community, again, is a huge difference. And I, my job, I have more flexibility because I'm not really running as many groups as the guidance counselors. And um, I don't see the kids one-on-one -on -one so much. I'm working with the families more so. So, and another way that I'm getting referrals is now that I've been out in the community, been around school, the adults, the parents, I should really say guardians, which include parents, um, grandparents, aunts, guardians, they're starting to get more comfortable with me because I've spent this last year building up relationships with them, which is really nice. I really appreciated that piece this year. I also uh, engage with them at ACT, at the school functions, and outside waiting for the bus. And I'm also with the United Way Kids and Copes Committee, and that's a great way to navigate resources with the parents. It might start as Copes, but then it can lead to a lot more. And again, another person that I work closely with and can send their concerns to me is our school nurse. She may uh, identify difficulties in reaching guardian in regards to immunizations, eye or dental care, physicals. And these obstacles for the parents include their work schedules, um, lack of or unreliable transportation, 
their phone, their phones, they may, um, simply their voicemails get full a lot, and so it becomes difficult, but I can get out and meet with the, the parents. <coughs> this fall, many of the parents need, the guardians had um, Medicaid difficulties because it seemed like Medicaid um, decided to really get everyone to be reinstated if they were out of compliance and all, it seemed to happen at the same time. So yeah. I spoke to other counselors, I spoke to Medicaid themselves I called to see what was going on, what was happening. <clears throat> so now I can proactively prepare the parents because it's gonna happen again in August because that's the time of year that that will be up. And so for the nurse, that was a big obstacle for the families too. They didn't have Medicaid, so they had no funding and they were being turned away <coughs> from what they need. Um, I also communi communicate and collaborate with the Department of Children and Families and HCRS. And these are agencies that are working with children at risk and the families. I work quite collaboratively with them and we meet and they also identify other um, obstacles that, because they have different, um, there's, they, have, they have different <coughs> things that out with the families as well, and so I can help supplement them. If we have family safety meetings, I can attend those. If parents are having a hard time getting transportation to any of these meetings, I can offer that. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a group from HCRS called IFBS, which is Intensive Family-Based Services, and they are, their role is to get into the home, and I've created an alliance with them, so we work in tandem to get into the house to help, uh, for example, this week, the school-based clinician, whose um, client is a family out there, has found secure housing, so we've been gathering up furniture and I don't know if you've noticed, but the Colonial Spa is redoing their rooms, so they've had all this free furniture out there. So I've just been squirreling it away, and I'll be bringing that to them that, uh, this Friday. So that's another great um, alliance I've made in the community. Uh, let's see. Also, there's students that are in custody in our school, and I liaison between the school, the foster placement, the Department of Children and Families, and IFBS again, and so the hope is when they can get secure enough to get their children out of custody, we c I can help the transition smoother. I'll know the foster parents, I'll know the guardians, and we can work together with the agencies to get the student back into our school. So since uh, that's some of the structure and some of the, way I, uh, the ways I get referrals, I didn't know if you'd be interested in like, what some parts of my day might be. Yeah. Okay, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> like tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll come in and there's a 504 meeting. So I'll attend that and it's a family that I've just given emotional support to and they're working super hard and they're using a lot of their resources already. And they're just a family that I can support in that way. And they're, again, they're just, they're really working hard. Uh, then after that, what I mentioned, there will be a step, there will be a meeting with step group program here at Academy. And um, we'll be meeting with foster parents and the teachers and planning a strategy to transition a child that's been in an out of school placement. So that'll be another part of my day. Then uh, part of my day is also Again, just trying to follow up with phone calls or texting. I got a phone that parents seem to text more than they can call. So that's been a huge tool for me. And just following up, trying to get these um, meetings out to them and get the dates set. Can they make it and can I help them get there? For IEPs, 504s, uh, a variety of meetings. And uh, tomorrow I'm also, Later in the day, some of the teachers have come to say that there haven't been enough packets for girls on the run. So I'll be kind of facilitating that. I've had two parents this week 
interested in after school programs. So I'm trying to introduce some ideas to them. It might be big brothers and big sisters through youth services, or it might it could be one of the school um, after school functions that we do here. And there's also um, a program called Aspire that's through the YMCA. So the parents aren't aware of that. Introduce that and follow up with that. Um, that will probably be my day until Friday. And Friday, the first of the month, there's a student attendance council that I attend. That's once a month, so that'll be happening. And there is usually a family placement team, a oh, family resource, resource team. team. Yeah. But that's not happening tomorrow. Friday? Well, they usually don't send the email up tomorrow. <laughs> Nine o'clock. It is happening? I don't know. It usually is. Okay, well, I'll be spending a little time figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> and then after those two meetings, um, I'm excited. I think our school based clinician can help with me and the other family and kind of move them in. So, yeah. yeah, that is. Oh, and tomorrow's Friday, so that's backpack day because uh, we start. Tomorrow's the day after tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Thank you. So Friday. <laughs> they all blur after a while. <laughs> um, in addition to the move, we have, uh, Mary and I started a program with 30 kids to have backpack food sent home for the weekend. I just want to make mention that when Mary sent out the letters, it was around the holidays and they were sent through the mail and for a variety of reasons, parents couldn't get back to me or Mary. So we had six. But when I called them or text them, I got the responses from everybody but two. And three families um, kindly said, pass it on to another family who might need more. So I'm pretty excited about that program. And that's my death. That's been my role. So one quick question yeah. I assume you guys are going to chime into. But the question I wondered is if you feel like there's overlap. not. In a, in overlap meaning that it's excessive, but I, I hear a lot of collaboration, but do you feel like we're overstepping or overlapping into some of the other areas that are already out there? Or do you feel like it's necessary just to get the families connected, that they wouldn't find those services otherwise? By, by overlapping, do you mean I don't need to be with them, or about which kind of just the, ex, the There's a lot of existing services that you're talking about okay. helping them hook into. Mm -hmm. And so I would think that somebody sitting here listening to that might say, but we already pay our tax dollars for those services. Why do we need yet another person reaching out that we're paying more tax dollar money? So if we could touch on that. I feel like it, it wouldn't flow as easily, Jill. I feel like... There would be lax in communication. I'm a person who can get a hold of these, of the, the guardians frequently, and I also know how the student's doing, and through the counselors as well, mm -hmm. we can see changes in behaviors or if their emotions are looking a little less regulated. So instead of being an overlap, it feels more like a cohesiveness. If I could also touch on that. Um, one of the things that many of the staff here do, and I have to give Andy some credit for this, because not only does he allow it, I think he promotes it, is that we can get out during the day and take a little walk. So Jody and I walk like probably four or five days a week. Whenever we can get out, we are always collaborating. We are always talking about cases, about families. And oftentimes I wish that I could clone myself, you know, that I could be here, do what I'll do, mm -hmm. what I do here, and still be out there and have the community be my office. Obviously I can't. Mm -hmm. So a lot of cases, there are just so many needs that by cooperating with her, coordinating with her, we've been able to really help a lot of families in a much deeper way. So I don't in any way see it as a conflict. I really see as her as my colleague and teammate, and it's been a huge blessing mm -hmm. having her for our families. Like, IFBS could be working, thank you, Judith. <coughs> they could be working with the family in the home, and, and they could be communicating with the Department of Families and Children. But for this, Right now, the Department of Children and Families, as you know, has a lot of changes going on. And it, you have to be kind of dogged to even be sure the social worker has been identified. And that's something I can do. I mean, I mean Jill, I think you would say, <clears throat> if someone posed that question to, to a board member or uh, 
about the overlap and, and is all these different agencies. Um, there's, um, from the school perspective, it's very difficult at times to get a hold of, of one of the agencies that might be the appropriate agency to deal with mm -hmm. the situation. Um, the, if people think that all you have to do is call DCF or, or call HCRS and someone's there waiting to, okay, if right over, take care of it, it's, it's a myth. It's, it's very difficult to uh, get the services for families. It can take a significant amount of time to do that um, and not get a favorable response. And I'm not being critical of those agencies because they're, they are so overloaded to the max that the need has um, far exceeded the capacity of the agencies to respond in our community right now. So, um, so we have to, because we're here to do whatever we can to make sure that the kids come to school ready to learn um, and are as healthy as possible, are, are having their, their basic needs met, then we had to go out and create this position. Otherwise, um, a lot of kids, a lot of families would not uh, be in position. They'd be falling through the cracks. Right. And Catherine kindly reminded me, the IFBS is a 90-day uh, involvement. They pull out after 90 days. So I can keep that as a person who could, like myself, keep that going. Yes. Um, when you deal with the state agencies, um, DCF, HCRS, coming from 35 years of experience trying to deal with HCRS and DCF, with the Department of Labor, they can be rather reticent uh, in sharing information. Are you the primary social worker or is somebody at DCF or HCRS the primary social worker? And are they sharing information? Or they say, I'm sorry, that's confidential and then you have to recreate files, you have to recreate connections and links. Um, I understand exactly what Jill is saying. There sounds like there is a considerable amount of overlap and it could be because of the state agency's inability to deal with the massive number of people that are coming in. I hear more collaboration than actually case management. Are you the case manager, Julie? No, I, I do case management like tasks, but I'm not identified as a case manager. Does DCF or ACRS share their information? Do you have access to their folders on your particular families? Um, there's, I don't go in and read files, but. So you have to recreate your own file on a particular family well, as to what services are being provided and what services are needed and. Well, the files could be like this big, Mark. Oh, so, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. So, what I do instead, there's open cases, and they are kids that are not in custody, yes. and that person, I work closely with her, and we are really working hard to keep the kids out of custody. We, may, we might do those safety plan meetings. We might um, you know, make arrangements for that person to get to out, re, up, you know, reach up, or get them to the dentist. Mm -hmm. and. So those are open cases as well, but they're out of custody. Then there's the kids in custody. And I have a relationship with those agencies from my previous job. And I, you know, they are, with the kids that are in custody, right. those social workers, Department of Children and Youth so Social Workers, do share information. And the ones that are not, that are still in their guardian's custody, the parents and the grandparents have been really good about signing releases. They, they want them, the majority want to get help. Yeah, are the agencies honoring those releases? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I could just add to that, Mark, because that, that was an excellent question. Um, the other thing that Jody does, which has been really awesome, mm -hmm. is that, uh, of course, we all do some of that coordination as well, and we try to make phone calls to the social workers at DCF, et cetera. She's made relationships, and she knows some of those people personally. She goes down yeah, to go DCF. Down. And then she just sits and talks with them about students and families and concerns. And I think because she's building that trusting relationship, they are sharing the information with her, which then really helps us in our work. So again, the fact that she gets out into the community and has built that trust has really helped our families. The other thing we're able to do um, is at the family resource meeting that Jody spoke about, we are officially impaneled 
um, with the state as a group that can share resources. We're protected under the law um, in terms of confidentiality, privileges of sharing back and forth. So Sue O'Brien, the director of DCF, is right there at the meeting with us. And in that situation, we are totally collaborating and sharing and connecting. Because you know, I, I did not want to get the sense that our social worker was sort of on the periphery of all this mm -hmm. and is actually serving the, the state minions um, no. as opposed to being a collaborative partner right. with this. If, if I could just speak, and Mark, it makes me think about your comment in the summer yeah. when we talked about the intense needs of uh, students and families in Brattleboro. I just see Jody's work really complementing the in-school staff right. and really working so closely with the, um, st the state agencies, the social service agencies. Well, I do too. I just hope the state agencies are more forthcoming than well, they were when what I was trying to do with yeah, so I, I, I know Jody's work directly. I, I know her work directly from her previous work, and I, I see the connections that she's already had yes. and, and the relationships that have been developed. It's seamless, and, and I, I know they don't look at it as, well, she's taking our work. It, it's, it's to actually collaborate and make sure that things get done in a timely way as opposed to mm -hmm taking weeks and they just don't have the capacity to deal with these things. So uh, I'm just thrilled that uh, somebody with Jody's background, Jody's doing this work. And it, it really is um, a Thank godsend you, Jody, to our families, that. along with the rest of these folks, because we're going to hear a little bit more about okay. other things as well. That was my big concern. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mark, maybe this will help you too, is a lot of times there's conditional care orders mm -hmm. or there's a case plan. You might be already familiar with that. They share that with me, and that's that's tangible things that a parent has to get done to get their Good. their safety into their home, so the student can get back. So there. you're the go-to person for Academy Green Street and no, or just, just Academy. Academy. Just how many families are you working or families are you working with? Well, I did a little count. I would say <coughs> there's different levels of working with them, but probably sixty. 100 of the of the children and just like so yeah I, and I could recount it because sometimes I count the same family with the kids so I could do a more precise but it's also levels of connecting and I um, think there's could be three levels considered green yellow and red and green would be you know the parents maybe I have to make a phone call or just slight little direction to help out and then I could categorize yellow they I keep checking in with them they might need more services and then the red are at the at-risk level. True. Well, just yeah. wanted to um, be cognizant of the fact, you know, we have 350 fam, uh, students or so. Um, perhaps 10 of those children are in state custody. Mm -hmm. um, and, and only a few only a few of our families are really involved with DCF. And, and DCF, I mean, the way you get involved with DCF is there is neglect or abuse. Um, so, we don't want a lot of our families involved with DCF. Um, and then, um, you know, HCRS, well, for our families, they basically, they're offering, offering family therapy or, or, or um, therapy for children or for parents. Um, and then there's the rest of the kids. And, the, and most of our students and families aren't involved with either agency. Um, and so, so Jody's working when she says six to a hundred. The vast majority of those kids and families are not. It's not related to DCF or, or HCRS. Mm -hmm. right. uh, I, remember, I mean, seventy-two percent of our students right now um, are meeting the federal <coughs> poverty level as defined uh, in schools as free and reduced lunch. Seventy-two percent. So it's one in four are not. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Did the rest of you all want to jump in? Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for right Jody now. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> you want the overhead? I'm sorry, what? Do you want the overhead? No. Okay. So um, I just made some copies which we can pass around. We decided not to use the overhead so people don't have to crank their necks and be turned around backwards. So um, myself and Catherine and Tracy 
are the counselors here in Brattleboro Town, and we're going to talk a little bit about our role. Um, do you want and, one of um, these handouts to? We give her one, Judy. She can, Judy, she can follow along. And she okay. Can. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> So our roles are multifaceted and dynamic and they cover a lot of areas, counseling and consultation and coordination. We're going to talk about those different roles and teaching. I think one of the most important things that I want to say is that as a school counselor, we really are there for all the students. So oftentimes we talk about like tiers of support and we say there's certain kids that need this much academic help or this much behavioral help, but we're there for all the kids, all the faculty and all the parents. And um, you'll see on this list, in terms of some of the different supports that we offer, we do individual counseling with students. We do a lot of group counseling, uh, sometimes crisis intervention, supporting parents, and again, collaborating with teachers. So all of us attend many of the meetings that we have in school, like educational support team, uh, 504 teams. Uh, we all have student leadership groups that we work with. and. Um, Again, I think one of the most important things is that we are, for these students, starting in kindergarten, the first role model that they're going to help, that they're going to have of a helping professional. So my biggest priority would be with all the students in the school is that they trust me. And they know that I'm someone that they can come to for whatever reason. So it might have been in the old days that you'd say, oh, well, you have like the bad boys or you have the bad kids that come to see you. I take it completely from another point of view that I see my work as a farmer almost, planting seeds, prevention work, that I'm trying to raise a generation of kids that are peacemakers, that know how to solve conflicts and think critically, kids that have friendship skills, social skills, an understanding of their emotions, and an ability to manage their emotions. So um, I start out with like all the kindergarten students. Every kindergarten student has a chance to come down to my office and be in like a little friendship group. Because again, I want them to recognize my face, know that I'm a safe person that they can go to, whether they're just sad about something, maybe there's a change going on at home, they're having a conflict with a peer, whatever it might be. And as Jody was saying in her role, um, we get our clients, so to speak, or our referrals in a lot of different ways. So I might be in an educational support team and a student's name comes up and we identify the student as really having a problem with social skills or friendship skills. So we might decide that we're going to design a group around that student, adding some peers in, or that maybe there's a student that needs to see me one-on-one -on -one for a while. Oftentimes it will be a parent that will call me up and say, my son or daughter is going through a really rough time. Can you check in with them? And of course, oftentimes from teachers. So being a trustworthy adult that all um, students can count on is really important. And <clears throat> I think this applies to teachers too, in that I want teachers to be able to feel for whatever reason that they can come to me, shut the door, what they say is gonna be confidential, and there's someone there who is willing to listen and have empathy for them. Um, so I think it's a, it's a role that, ha that we wear a lot of hats. You know, During their day, there might be a lot of different things that we're doing, but uh, the real important thing is just helping and teaching kids to be productive members of society, kids that can manage their emotions, that can sit and listen to someone else, that can take a different point of view, that can solve a problem. So that's, uh, I guess, one of the main ways that I see the role. And I guess I'll turn it over to Catherine. Um, to just sort of follow up on what Judith was talking about, one of the sort of main pieces that as a you know, as a group of counselors that we feel really committed to and that the schools are experiences that the schools really need from us is guidance around social emotional curriculum and social emotional learning for all the students. Um, and it's different in each school, but the dedication and the commitment to ensuring that kids develop their emotional literacy over their experience in elementary school. And key to that is cultivate strategies and skills to be able to regulate their emotions. Um, 
I think the other piece that's unique about the role as a school counselor that we have, which is a really cool thing about it, is that we follow these kids from the minute they walk in the door. And, and they, they know who their second grade teacher is, and they remember who their fourth grade teacher is. But in our minds, we've been following them since the day they registered at kindergarten. And so we see them through a variety of developmental stages. And we have a sense of an awareness about their own development, particularly in the social emotional realm. So some of the curriculums that we implement May, may be selected because it's a particular fit for one of the schools more than another, but the, the effort and the, um, the skill sets that we're teaching very much overlap. So some of the things, the curriculums you might hear are things like social thinking skill, which, which Tracy's doing a lot of right now, Zones of regulation, I do a lot of that right now in teaching small groups and classroom work. Um, second step, Judith is in all the classrooms at Academy teaching second step social skills. At Oak Grove, um, we have a particular curriculum that I and other team members of our PBIS team actually created to teach the guiding principles and the expectations. And so, Jerry in the schedule has made sure that every Monday morning in every kindergarten through sixth grade class, they're all doing a social expectation lesson on our guiding principles. The other ones we, you may hear about are we care. So the state may mandate a particular, um, or has mandated through Act One that all the schools be responsible for sexual abuse and child safety prevention curriculum. And that we've collaborated with the Vermont um, Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Organization. They have a curriculum. We've all been trained in that curriculum. We implement them in, in the classrooms with the teachers present. We may then also train the teachers and the staff on prevention additional curriculum that we may be using are our mind up which is teaching kids mindfulness skills again self-regulation what do i do when i'm having these big feelings and what are different ways i can cope with them the michigan model is a is a curriculum that's used in all the schools doing health education and again we may be individually teaching in a class or collaborate with the teacher or the school nurse to do that and that depends in each one of our schools. But we, we really see it as kind of our responsibility to make sure that the curriculum is happening and provide the support where needed. Um, that may look like a class-wide lesson. It may look like small groups may be getting specific skills in social thinking or in um, self-regulation. So really, it it's kind of school by school, case by case, teacher by teacher. How do we ensure that the kids throughout their elementary years get the kind of skills um, and strategies that they need? And so listed here below this are some other things, I think, really um, very much relevant to the, this these years is digital citizenship and internet safety. And we do that in a variety of ways. That may look like working with a particular curriculum or collaborating with the Brattleboro Police to come into the school. So it really varies, but it, our job is to make sure it's happening and to do it somehow. It's great. Perfect. Before Tracy goes, I just have to compliment the counselors. I see their work directly with our middle school leadership training and where they have the number seven student leadership teams. It's these folks that are really the adult supporters, the advisors to the students. And, and I know the work that the middle school, the upper elementary school students do with the younger grades mm -hmm. with their support. And then we complement that with high school students with courses that are working with the middle schoolers. So, and, and upper elementary kids. So it's really because of these people that we're able to have this social emotional learning the way we do throughout the district. So thank you. Thank you. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about community collaboration because that's also one of our, the hats that we wear. Um, so when we were talking about families er, you know, earlier, families come to Brown Road Town Schools with a multitude of needs. And I think those needs have changed and shifted over the years. And so as a school counselor, it's really critical that we A, recognize the needs of the families and we look outside of our building to find the support because schools help kids learn and outside agencies hope, hopefully support families and children as they grow um, in other ways. So some of the people that we collaborate with quite closely are um, youth services and we do that through two of the programs. The first program is the Big Brothers Big Sisters program. I think all three of our schools have mentors coming into our building during lunch. Not yet. Yes, waiting. Okay, so we have that happening at Green Street, and everyone else is getting there. But it's really cool. What does we, we have the academy does too? So we have these mentors that come in um, during their lunch time, and they sit and they have lunch with the kids, and then they go out to recess, facilitate play on the playground with kids. It's this really great program. Um, we also have community-based mentors that work with kids. I know Judith, you're a big sister. Um, where they take kids out and they do really cool things that maybe are experience building, that help kids learn that there's a bigger world perhaps than where they're currently living. Um, it allows them to dream and experience um, the world maybe in a different way than they would, um, you know, staying within their family circle. So those are really cool um, experiences with the Big Brothers Big Sisters. Actually, Green Street's really lucky we get to work pretty closely with Gina Graziano. We were um, chosen to be part of this many partnership that we have going on, and it's a funding um, source, this many partnership. And um, what happens is they use our program as a role model to show other programs how that, um, you know, how schools and Big Brothers Big Sisters can um, collaborate to create solid relationships for kids and for families and to support kids as they grow emotionally. Um, the other program which is um, helpful for families, particularly around attendance, is the School Success Program. We work really closely with Jocelyn York, who is um, the coordinator, and she helps us with kids who have chronic attendance issues, particularly in the higher grades, grades four through six. Um, if we have a kiddo who has 15 or more absences, um, we are required to do an affidavit, we're required to send some letters out, um, but those things are all paperwork, and that's important things, believe me, I know that. But um, what's really important is we get the kid to school. And so Jocelyn York helps work with families. They, she sits down with the families and she creates a plan. How are we gonna get your kid to school? What's the barriers for getting your kid to school? And um, she also comes in and works with the, with the school staff. And what do you see as the barriers for so-and-so coming to school? And she helps kind of facilitate a round table around us working with kiddos and helping them to attend school and hopefully overcoming any barriers that are going to prevent them from academic success. Not only do we want kids to come to school, but we also want kids to come to school ready to learn, able to access their brain. And so if they're struggling or worrying about other things, um, they're less uh, you know, able to learn um, while at school. Um, oh, this is another cool thing. Um, the another. Um, agency that we collaborate with is the Reach Up program at Economic Services. We all, we all work with um, Reach Up case managers. Um, my, I am really committed to trauma-informed work in Green Street School. We started it a few years ago and we're really trying to increase our capacity as far as supporting families who have experienced trauma. And so um, Amy Goldberg, who's a Reach Up worker for Economic Services, and I decided to um, pinpoint four families that we knew um, had experienced trauma that needed extra wraparound support. And um, we decided that we would ask the family's permission if we could collaborate. And we've started meeting together with these families. So Amy can provide the support in the community, help the families get what they need as far as you know, we're mentioning Medicaid. Medicaid's a huge obstacle for a lot of families. And then I can help with the school piece. So the goal of this um, collaboration is to increase families' engagement within school, but also within the community. Um, you know, we do work closely with DCF. It's kind of a necessity of our position. Um, we work with DCF around, um, obviously, filing reports. But more importantly, 
we work with DCF to support families with open cases when they are working to um, improve parenting skills. Also, if we're helping kids who are in the foster care system, um, making sure that they're getting what they need, um, you know, whether it be emotional support within the school, outside the school, making sure that we're communicating with foster families, with ed surrogate parents who are the people assigned to kiddos who have IEPs, who um, they protect the child's educational rights. So there's a lot of coordination that happens with DCF, frequent meetings with DCF to go over case management and case plans with, um, with school members and with um, foster care people, um, collaborated with um, UVM, and they came and did a foster parent training um, right at Powers House near Green Street because foster parents it's really tricky. Kids come with a lot of issues when they go into foster care. So having um, someone who's an expert who can support foster parents as they support our children in the community who've been, you know, hurt, unfortunately, um, was really helpful. And foster parents constantly reach out for support. Um, we all have HCRS clinicians in the building. Um, it's a great collaboration. It's an opportunity for kiddos and families to get served, to get um, therapy while at school. Um, it's an opportunity for us to do some wrap services with families um, with HCRS. We um, work really closely with HCRS as far as um, referrals for um, families to get therapy through HCRS. Um, Elizabeth Bianchi is a school-based um, director of services and she comes and meets with our clinicians and the counselors on a regular basis just to get an update on what's going on with kids and how do we support kids better in school as well as what services do they need outside of school that HCRS may be able to fulfill that need. So it's a way for us to really do some wrap services for kiddos. Um, we work with local churches. Local churches are so generous. They give our kids coats. They give our kids food. Um, so we do a lot of work with any churches that are willing to donate. We definitely support that. Um, we do the backpack program at Green Street um, in at Oak Grove. Mm -hmm. um, and that's through the Vermont Food Bank. And that gives kiddos food for the weekend. So if they're, you know, if they're worried about food and they're hungry, um, there's a little bag of food that goes home with them. Um, we also, through our leadership programs, we do a lot of fundraising, and I know Oak Grove raises money for Groundworks Collaborative, mm -hmm. and Judith talks about Project Feed the Thousands and raising money for Project Feed the Thousands. Um, my RJ kids, they um, wanted to raise money for Pencils of Promise, which is this really cool organization that builds schools. Um, where kids don't have school, so they don't get a chance to go to school. Um, so um, we do, you know, fundraising that way through our leadership. Um, we work with the United Way. We work with Girls on the Run. Um, Girls on the Run is a great program for kiddos, so we collaborate, make sure that the kids who need that experience get that. Um, we work with local therapists to make sure that, if, with a release, to make sure that the therapists are aware of anything that's going on within the school. And I'm very happy to report that starting next week, um, we're going to be working with the um, Menadna Humane Society. We're going to have um, therapy dogs in Green Street School working with kiddos who have experienced trauma. And that's another way that we're just kind of working with um, kiddos and families to support them around overcoming any adverse childhood experiences. So it's a lot. So, <laughs> I was making a joke today saying we should wear a little uh, GoPro camera on our heads just so that you could see all the different places we end up in a given day. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, obviously we could talk for like an hour or two. We literally could sit here for an hour or two and just go on about our work. And you can tell that we all love our work, we're very passionate about it. Uh, the therapists that we have in this community, and we have wonderful therapists, are so key. And we don't have either the time or it's not really, it's not a role that we can do therapy. And there are so many kids that might need that little extra boost. And just as I would never want a kid to feel a stigma that he came to my office and so, oh, he's a bad, bad boy, bad girl, whatever, because they came to see me. I feel the same way so strongly about mental health professionals. 
and probably all of us in this room at one point maybe have seen a therapist, might need to see a therapist, or a go-to really great confidant. And what I feel really awesome about is when I can call a parent and we can talk about it and I can make a referral and then I know that kids start seeing a therapist and sometimes I'll see that little boy or girl and they'll be standing out in the hallway ready to go and I know it's like Thursday at 2.30 or whatever. And it's like, huh, you're gonna see your therapist today? And they say, oh yeah, I can't wait. And they feel excited and they don't feel any shame, any stigma. And to me, that's what positive good health and mental health is about. So thank goodness that we do have good therapists and that we can refer kids out and that folks work with us, sign releases, and that then we can all coordinate and be on the same page by calling therapists and saying, this is what we're seeing in the classroom, this is what we're worried about. They can share with us information, maybe strategies they're using so that we can all coordinate, and again, in the best interest of that kid. So it's really wonderful that we have really good resources like that in Brattleboro. I think you've convinced us all there's enough to do in your day and all. <laughs> but, um, so I'm, I'm back to kind of the same question now from a slightly different angle than I gave to Jody, but there's a lot of need, mm -hmm. and I'm sure, I'm gonna guess anyway, that both Oak Grove and Green Street would say, sure, we could have a social worker as well and utilize that person. Of course, taxpayers feel like there's a limit here. Is there a way, perhaps, Jody, to extend what you're doing in, without extending yourself? And, and it's kind of the question I threw out last week about the technologist, te technology integration specialist. Right? Um, is there any way to somewhat share three schools but one position? not taking you out of one school, but that what we talked about with the technology person was professional development that would be going on. I don't know if that's really something here. But. The, the thing I think about is the family resource um, group, mm -hmm. where, where these people all get together on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. and maybe it could happen more, but to uh, with the social service agencies and, and just kind of sharing situations and problem solving and so that, that coordination does, does occur. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be extremely um, difficult to, to take a position and just mm -hmm. spread it too thinly. I, I think you'd be spreading it too thin. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, like, how do we tap mm -hmm. into, um, like, new things you may be aware of? Like, I heard right away, like, oh, furniture. <laughs> Who do I know in my family that need furniture? <coughs> so that may be something that I could, you know, I can follow Call up Jody about. with you about and say, hey, do you have any leads on mm -hmm. whatever? Mm -hmm. But I, I just, when I think of, we have, we're a smaller population at Oak Grove, um, and we have our clinician, and I can only imagine the experience that when you have 300 plus kids that I think, mm. I, I couldn't imagine, I know what my job is yeah. like, I can't imagine you having a moment in your day to, mm. to get over to another school. Yeah, I uh, haven't really thought about that until. I mean, the, the, I mean, think about where we are, Oak Grove and uh, Green Street combined are roughly right. equal to us, yep. so. Um, <coughs> This is a full-time job. Jody, Jody, you know, starts in the morning. Um, as she said, some oftentimes she's dealing with kids, our families, at, um, before school begins, when they're when they're bringing parents are bringing kids in. Um, so her day starts then. Um, if there's any kind of evening meeting with parents, she's here. So she's making those contacts. She's visible, um, and. There's 90 employees in this building who all have contact with students who also are dealing with her um, and, and students. So, um, so if we were to say, okay, starting next Tuesday, we're, we're going to double your workload and we're going to have, and we're going to actually, in some ways, more than double it because you're going to have to be in three different sites and I want you to be really effective. Um, you know, she could do it, but I would say if you're going to do that, just take back the money to get it because you're wasting you're you're wasting taxpayer money. The position's not worth it. Just take it back, and we'll do something else, um, and we'll stop doing what we're doing. Um, and yeah, it's costing more money, and the taxpayers didn't realize this. It's costing more money in Broward to educate kids 
because we have poverty. We have a majority poverty community. And we have kids who are coming to us with more needs than ever. The kids that we're dealing with right now in schools every day, um, 20 years ago, would have been institutionalized. And we're dealing with them every day, um, whose parents are uh, having enormous problems, many of which are created by opioids uh, and other issues. So we're dealing with all that, and I know taxpayers um, are frustrated because property taxes are not going down, but it, it's, a, it's a huge problem that goes beyond the school. It's a community problem, it's a state problem, it's a national problem, um, and we're the only hope for these kids. You know, 74% of our kids are living in poverty in this school right now. We're their only hope that they're going to, to break that cycle of poverty. They have to get an education, or um, we're going to be paying for them the rest of our lives. So, um, and, the, and the alternatives are so much more expensive. Um, it's just, you know, staggering when we think about what's going to happen to these kids if we don't um, you change the path that you're on right now. I would just offer that <coughs> Jody's position is, is uh, a new position. Uh, we're learning a lot from it. I know the counselors are learning from Jody. Um, this time next year, or November next year, maybe um, start thinking about, okay, so is there, is there room to create another position that would be split between Green Street and Oak Grove? And think about the turnover rate with staffing that may allow to have that happen. So. Um, that might be a way to, to spread out the resources. There's, there's other financial indicators as well. Um, it, it's not just an education that you're offering these, these students that, that are struggling with issues at home. I mean, you're stabilizing emotionally uh, through diet, through all these things, and you're creating solid citizens beyond their, just their education. Some of those ways that that affects your budget is we, we pat ourselves on the back for reducing our special ed costs. Well, the, the way that we're able to do that is to keep kids in district and mm -hmm. keep them in our schools. So if we can't provide these services and we can't stabilize children and they can't access the education that we're offering them in our schools, then we send them to schools outside of the district and the cost goes up and up and up. So I just think uh, it's a part of a bigger picture that we need to realize, you know, these interventions they don't just have spiritual and emotional impacts, which they do, and that's beautiful, but they're, uh, the bottom line of that, that special ed savings comes from us being able to keep kids in school. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Um, and, you know, we obviously have to be very mindful about confidentiality at these meetings, but there are definitely cases that Jody's been really instrumental with mm -hmm. some kids that are out of school placement, again, with the goal of their overall well-being and getting them back in school as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That saves us money. Mm -hmm. well, uh, at the uh, April meeting, we'll have some data on this. Um, uh, and I don't have it on, um, at my disposal right now, but if you go back um, 10 or 15 years uh, before the opioid uh, crisis um, hit our community and uh, before poverty uh, had risen to such height, we um, back before we had you know so many of the issues we're confronting right now in our community, we actually had more students in the elementary system in out of district placements than we do today. Mm -hmm. So the the uh, the community was healthier, there was less poverty, we didn't have the opioid uh, issues, and we had more kids in out of district placement. We were paying tuitions than we do today. That's that's. That's remarkable. It's counter to what every other community virtually in the state is, is doing right now, that we've managed to do that. And we do it because we've been, we've been able to be innovative or create programs or create supports and we've gotten the, the backing, the support from the board and from the, the community, the town, the taxpayers. Um, and there's no shortcut way to do it. But, um, and it's all related. Mm -hmm. You know, from counseling to social work to all the training that our teachers get in mm -hmm. um, the social and, um, and academics and so forth. It's all related. It's all interrelated. And if you pull out one piece, um, it's like a house of cards. Hmm. Andy, building on what uh, Todd said and what you just added to it, is there any way to extrapolate the data you were talking about from 10, 15 years ago and maybe showing a relative cost savings? 
to Jody's position and maybe, and I, I hear a great case for adding another uh, Jody to the right. okay? yeah. And it seems to make a lot of sense. And that might be the convincer if you can show that by the added social services in-house to keep the students in-house as opposed to out-of-district uh, schooling, that it would justify the expenditure for an additional social worker to cover uh, Green Street and Oak Grove. And that would uh, obviously result in additional savings building on Todd's model. Well, we'll have data at the, um, at the, we're, we're planning on presenting that data at the forum. Mm -hmm. um, which is scheduled to like, get the date of that. That's scheduled the after the town meeting. Yeah. Okay, so we, we can bring that data uh, yeah, we would have that prior data. if you like it. Sure. <coughs> That's only a nice math problem, doesn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> congratulations to you all, because yeah. the reason for my question was kind of to hear that answer <laughs> out loud, mm -hmm. and so to, um, and to prepare us, because I think that is the question that comes out of the taxpayers, yeah. and and I think it comes out rightfully so because the tax the town meeting representatives are usually a bit removed from the school. They're not um, typically not a lot of them are parents with kids in the elementary school at that age. And it's um, for us to just keep saying poverty, poverty, poverty drives it becomes a bit like a broken record and doesn't make a picture in our heads as well as what we've just heard in the conversation we've just had. So I urge us all to remember this mm -hmm. because next meeting we'll be looking specifically at what we want to say during our town meeting prep night. And to be able, I think Mark's question is a good one, Andy, and the, the data that you're talking about. But um, it's much easier for someone who doesn't understand all of these mm -hmm. issues and doesn't work with it we question it and we're not working with it every day like all the rest of you. So to be able to say this is this is what we're faced with and this is what it costs and this is what we're doing with it. Um, otherwise it's easier for a town rep person to look at the budget and do the math and say okay so 15 years ago this is what it cost us per child and now it costs us this per child and we don't have we have this population and we used to have this population and hold on here. I still have the same house, basically, and you're now charging me this much more. Right. I mean, that's the mentality of somebody who's not there. So it behooves us all to remember this conversation. Do the rest of us have any more questions before we let these fine folks go home? It sounds like to a well-deserved <laughs> evening. Thank you for coming. Drive yes. carefully. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for asking the question. Yeah, that's a good question. So in the interest of Moving us all along so that people can go home. Frank also deserves a bit of a rest, so we could go to him next. Except Frank, we have to one thing out of that. Okay. So. Um, what makes him special? I think Frank's uh, done more meetings than any of the rest. I, I, <laughs> even I, I guaranteed that he would go early enough to get. There. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm <laughs> Blame me for that. He beats even you. Does he have a meeting? I'm but sure he does. no. <laughs> no. No, but nobody beats Ron. Ron. So the one question that we skipped over that I shouldn't have was when we were looking at the minutes and looking at what we're going to write in the minutes. We had a discussion last time and Kim wasn't here to hear that and Dave had also sent me something here that he would like to urge us to look at the minutes and the way that it was last time and he thinks that level of detail was good. We had a discussion about what we wanted. <laughs> do the rest of you all feel like that level of detail is good, or do we want something different? So, so that Kim has some direction. Kelly did those yep. minutes, right? It did. And I was a little time. worried because they were really long, but <laughs> there was you, a lot to, to talk about. I edited about down some, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I took out some. So the minutes. <coughs> sure. You're okay? Or? That's, it, it depends. Kim, would you feel comfortable with that level of detail? Can you keep up with us? Um, yeah, I, I actually, the first one I wrote, Jill edited the heck out of it. And, and, <laughs> it was and, much and, yeah, there was, there's a lot more detail, but it's, I like, I like having the bulletin points, I like having that sort of set that you know, but when someone's reading this, in order to understand it, if you haven't attended the meeting, 
the details are really important. There are many people who actually do read, <laughs> and it's it's really it's it's really hard as a recorder that when you want to represent someone, you don't want to it be yours. I, I mean, basically, so the details are pretty important. And so I, if anybody wants anything specifically in it, like Ron would said, oh, if you could just put that on the budget, the first part, that'd be great, and then everything else, you know, to be discussed, and, and da da da. That's great. So that's a good communication we can have because it also helped me as I'm taking the notes to uh, what to look for. But I think you're right. Um, it, it is long, but I think if somebody were to read this, in order to understand it, if you haven't been to the meeting before or haven't been, you know, I mean, it's really, really hard. So, so um, yeah, so I'm okay with that. I'm so okay with if, if it's a lengthy dissertation, uh, I no would you like a copy of the paper if they're doing it off of the paper? Would yeah, exactly. It, uh, we can always say attach. We can put you on the distribution list. Thanks. And mightily bored you'll be. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> Ty, did you have something you were going to say about this? Nope. No? I'm okay. comfortable with the detail. I'm with detail. I mean, it's all. Okay, that's details here, yeah. Perfect. And then the only other thing is that Dave pointed out something in the last minutes that I forgot about. That um, under, that we've already approved these minutes, but it's important that he said under the report on finance, the second bullet item said, Mr. Rucker suggests that the board utilize up to 350,000 in our capital reserves to be utilized for the project, which would have to be warned as an article of the town meeting, this avoids borrowing costs to the district with minimal transfers. He said it seems to indicate that we would not be borrowing $350,000 for the Green Street Boiler Project. I believe it should say we will be borrowing and paying debt service for the $350,000. That's right. So that correction should probably be made. That correction should be made. Yes. Okay. So I don't know what the parliamentary procedure is that we've already approved minutes. Oh, yeah, just approved yeah. based on the revision. Yep. Yeah. All right. So do we have to have a motion or? Yeah. Uh, the consensus. Yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I have a motion. Okay. As long as we, we get a make the I can forward that to you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Second. All right. So now, Frank, so that you can go home. Oh, okay. Very good. I have a document. Mary was so gracious to run off for us this evening. Thank you, Mary. Um, it's just and a, do you want to copy again? It's just a I single page. Lots of statistics. Can you bring it, Mary? Um, do we have enough all the way down the line there? I had to get this. Here we go. Plenty. Well, I think this is there. Um, and this is uh, this is really just as a, a a general response to some questions that um, Jill has forwarded to me, and I've discussed with Ron uh, preparation for our budget uh, meeting. So. Um, I, I'll give you a quick overview and then I'm sure um, Jill may uh, narrow the discussion to uh, what's of most interest based on some questions that have come up um, and been shared with Jill. So, uh, but, but what you're looking at here is 2013 um, school year through the current year, so on the very far right. Uh, are some dates, and uh, those are school year dates. Um, and uh, then uh, the next set of dates are uh, census. And I, I take a little time to give you this sort of background just because it's so easy for folks to get confused about how kids and money and tax bills uh, relate to each other. So I, I, I know that that's uh, kind of the central theme of the, the, the issue that Jill is clarifying. Um, so anyways, you have, you have a school year and then you have, you have a statistics that, that's collected in a calendar year. Very important to know um, where that fits in the scheme of things. And then just while we're talking about dates, if you go across this page, you see that we have budget, a budget period. You know, that's, that's uh, way over there on the right. Um, you see uh, budget fiscal year ending. And uh, the point I'm making here is that um, we collect uh, student statistics uh, for our census, you know, average daily membership, and we send it off to the state. We, we do that. Um, let's, oops. Let, let's do the current year. The current year is an example. 
So uh, current year you have uh, this past October, right, 2016. Uh, that's our fiscal year or, or the school year 2017, right, because it ends in June 2017. And then we go over across the page and we are talking about kids counted in October of 16 that set the tax rates for this fiscal year 18 budget. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why I'm taking a little time to just reacquaint you with this. I think you all know this. I, I know the general public doesn't. Um, and that creates questions. Um, so, so there's always three different periods in play when we're talking about kids we serve today, the way we staff our, our buildings based on current enrollment, and then the way we tax our public to pay for um, programs that we are planning for in the future. Okay? It's the way it's been for many, many years, so nothing new here. Uh, but, the, but the issues that are created this year are somewhat unique because the state has uh, altered the statistics quite a bit and, and they have prescribed a format in which we've learned our budgets that is confusing to the general public. Okay, so that's kind of the point of having this conversation. And we'll get to those warnings and the language during that part of the meeting and you'll be able to see how this comes up and it'll make more sense to you. Yep. So what I'm trying to uh, explain is the, the warning that, that the public is going to read has a reference to a cost per student going up 11%. The real the number is 10.9, okay, and yet um, the more important thing from a taxpayer's point of view is the data in the far right column. It's the tax rate, and we see the tax rate is actually down a little bit. I, I've rounded numbers so we don't have to look at too many numbers, but it's you know I show zero percent, but it's actually down uh, four tenths of one percent if you look at um, any of the documents we've looked at. Okay, so the tax rate is down, um, but why are we warning an article that says our spending per student is up 11%? That's the next column over, you see. Next column over, the, the fiscal year 18 budget has a spending per equalized student statistic of up 11%. Now, now how does that work? Uh, especially in the context of a budget that's down 10%. You see that? That's the next column. Budget's down 10%. We're going from 15 million 987 down to 14 million 417. So we've we've talked about that. You're you're familiar with that. But it, from the general public's point of view, these statistics don't make a lot of sense. But unfortunately, they are driven by the next set of data that I've I've shared with you, and that is equalized students. So. So we've, I'm going from the far right here to the left, and all of these things sort of tell the story. Our equalized students are down 10%. And when we know uh, a student st statistic that you divide into your spending, when, when you get a smaller number of kids in the denominator of a formula, the outcome is gonna, gonna push spending per student up, right? If we have million dollar budget we got a hundred kids that's ten thousand dollars a kid if you got a million dollar budget and you have 200 kids that's five thousand dollars a kid but you know we are going the other way million dollar budget divided by 50 kids now your your cost per student is going up to twenty thousand right so that's that's what's happening to us this year and yet the reality is as you know we, you look at uh, your actual enrollment, that's the next column over, it says total pre-K six, uh, I should say enrollment, but that's what, what, that's what that is in this document, okay? The actual enrollment's been pretty steady uh, when we include the pre-K. You see uh, those statistics from 14, 15, 16, and 17, you can look at the numbers or you can look at the percent changes, and the percent changes are not, you know, substantially uh, different. But equalized students is, right? Equalized students in the percent column, you see it goes from 3% increase, 2% increase, 7% increase, and then a 
decrease. That is the, a state statistic that we don't control. We don't have um, any, any much to do with that statistic from a planning and a, uh, you know, a, and a development. It, it is a reflection of the way in which the state takes our students and equalizes uh, those counts. And then we have to use that based on the school funding formula as the denominator to calculate our tax rate. Um, so I'm almost done my, my little overview, and then we can kind of translate it into, well, what are we doing with this? Um, so uh, one more thing I just want to point out. You see our, our actual uh, K through 6 enrollment is down. Um, so this is ex not including pre-K. You see it's consistently down. It, uh, unfortunately, there's, you, can, you can count um, students any day of the week, and you're going to get a different count every week. So this data is taken from an October count out of the power school system that Barb gave me today. Um, and the counts that you see in budget documents are an official census data collection that's reported November 1st, and it's a frozen statistic that is used to set tax rates. So I use that statistic. So when you're looking at your budget documents, you're going to see numbers that are a little bit different, but the trend is, is the same. And um, there's a one other thing that you might want to keep in the back of your mind. It, it just happens to be that when you add a negative 5% in the student enrollment, and a, a change and a negative three percent and a negative two percent that's a ten percent drop right cumulatively and when you go over to equalize students you see that same negative ten percent that's that's somewhat coincidental but uh, but but it, the relationship is definitely uh, direct it's a, a direct correlation between your actual count and your equalized student count over time so we don't have uh, probably enough time tonight to talk about how all of this stuff is derived, but, but because the state uses a two-year trailing average on equalized students, uh, you're not going to see the immediate impact um, in the equalized student count that you, that you will see when you know, um, each principal counts health students and shares that information with you. You're going to, you know, if you're down it's 10 years. students, you're going to see. It's a two-year trailing average statistic. And then beyond that, in their calculation, they're dealing with the getting rid of the phantom students. Yes. That's right. So that's another good point in that when you look at equalized students, you, you see this relationship where our actual student count is declining, but our equalized student count is increasing, but it's increasing at a slower rate. Over, this year. over prior years, there's been this way to, uh, they call it a phantom student calculation, which just means that as we were declining, as we were going from, from uh, 750 or 764 kids down to 724 kids, you see those drops? Mm -hmm. The state was saying, oh, that's more than a 3.5% statistic in terms of a percent decline, um, but we're, we're only going to give you an equalized student number that is limited to a 3.5% decline. Well, in, in this most recent year, they said, well, we're going to a 10% decline, and that's why a uh, big so reason why... if you why had a 20% actual decline, they would only give you 10% not. 3, 3.5%. That's right. If you had a 20% decline in one year, like if you went from 100 kids in one year to 80 <coughs> kids, that's a 20% decline. They're only going to say, oh, here's your 97 or 96 and a half kids, even though you only have 80 in that example. Mm -hmm. But in, in this year, this, this is a new year for us in terms of a new law. They've said, uh, nope, we're going to widen this, this protection. They call it a hold harmless protection to 10%. There, we're gonna, we're gonna, if you have 20% drop in, 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 in enrollment, we're, we're going to hit you with 10% of that. Not, not all 20, but we're going to widen the whole harmless provision. And that's, that's the convergence of these storms that are, that are hitting um, Brattleboro Town funding formula this year. We, we have a 
a substantial drop in our equalized student uh, count, um, uh, you know, along with uh, the other pressures that we read about in, in the Brownboro Town, you know, tax um, uh, 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 implications associated with services that are being asked for and provided. But the school board has managed that, as you can see, by through the use of reserves and uh, capital planning. Um, and and the, the, the result there is on the far side of the page. We, we have mitigated those, those uh, that volatility by um, 2015 budget. You used a half a million dollars worth of your fund balance. 2016 budget, we used none. 17, we used none. This fiscal year 18, we're using 130,000. That's the way in which, instead of passing this tremendous volatility to the taxpayer, the school board has flattened out the, the, the impact on the tax rate um, through the use of you know, good planning. So um, the, the, the one question that is, that is likely to come up when folks start reading this uh, article, the warning article, uh, how is it that the school board is presenting a budget that's up 11% per student? They might even not observe that this is a per student statistic that the state is required to be warned. Um, and the first response might be, for, as a school board, is, uh, okay, that's a cost per student statistic you're referring to, but let me make sure you understand our budget that we're proposing is down 10%. And the reason why cost per student is up is because the state has used an equalized student statistic that has been adjusted for the whole harmless provision, Act 46, that, that actually starts to reflect our true enrollment trend. Um, you also would want to point out that our taxes are actually projected to be uh, zero to slightly less than the current year. Um, Frank? Yeah. So that 10%, though, that means they're only taking into account K through 6? Because if you look at pre-K through 6, we're actually up from yeah. 2000. No, they are, they are taking into account pre-K through 6. But we don't up. show down. They're, brought, they're also bringing in the fact that uh, this Act 166 mm -hmm. provided for uh, the state to use an estimated number uh, using the pre-K count for the first time in the 2017 budget, and that's where you see this huge increase that we talked about this time last year that we said, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, and so we, we, created, we created the reserve um, knowing that when the state revisited this process and you'd have to have unfortunately the state of Vermont uh, folks explain what they did to go from 180 100 to, uh, 821 kids to 877 there, I've not been given an explanation that I can understand of how um, when we went for a total enrollment you see uh, your question Todd we went from total enrollment of 847 to 852 mm -hmm. and they went from an equalized statistic from 821 to 877 so you know in our in our data we're going up five kids and in their data they're going up 58 kids right 77 minus 21 is that right uh, right 56. 56 you know no one's been able to explain that to me uh, but that is a state statistic that um, they are, you know, I've, I've asked them to explain it, and they said, this is the way in which we interpret Act 166, and, and, and now uh, for fiscal year 18, it also incorporates Act 46 that has this whole harmless adjustment to it. Um, so uh, this, this causes us all a difficult conversation with somebody really wants to know how things work. 
Frank, did you? Well, I still don't understand that. Sorry. I mean, like, because if you go two years Don't back. get sick on time yeah. hitting dates, right? Yeah, yeah you're, we're, we're going to need you. Just because the you, bottom yeah. line is that it's a number we can't control. Right. Mm -hmm. That comes from the state. But it's the and only question I can answer when people ask me. About, I, can get, I can get them all the way up to the first part. Where, where you can say, oh, it's the equalized people, and that's, that's your per, per people, but then I can't go any further. Yeah, when I talk about it, I don't know how they get that number. Here, here's answer. a couple of pieces for you, if you wanted to try to explain it. Um, prior, prior to 2016, so now we're talking about 2015, you know, 14, 13, there, the universal pre-K did not exist. That law came in in 2016. Um, and so for the 2016, you know, period, um, the state um, incorporated what we have been doing for years and years with essential early ed, the Head Start program. It was essentially off the books because the state um, recognized that the early Head Start in Brattleboro is funded by the federal Head Start grant. And so those kids were not counted in the Brattleboro um, data collection, okay? But in uh, 2016, uh, that would be the, you know, the, the school year, 2016, uh, they said, oh, we're, Act 166 is now in play, and we're, you guys got to count. So that brought in 100 um, new kids on the pre-K level um, that, went through some sort of an equalization calculation, which again, I, I don't do, I don't know what it is. All I know is what, you know, Mark and Andy and Jerry report in November to uh, the AOE as far as, here are the kids in my school, and then between um, Barb and Paul Smith and uh, Gene Gilbert, others, uh, Janice Stockman, uh, they are aware of the folks that each district is cutting a check for for the pre-k providers okay so we we know we know what we report to them and we verify that and so we understand that but um, what explains going from 821 to 877 which is the core of the problem it is primarily act 166 allowing uh, a, a very different way to, to account for pre preschool programming in our opinion they over estimated those accounts because there's nothing that would explain such a large increase um, other than that. Um, so, so then compounded with adjusting for an overestimated, uh, thank you, overestimated statistic for pre-K, compounding on top of that, they, they, uh, re they threw in another law that says, and now we're going to unleash that warehouse of phantom students that you have where we protected you from three and a half percent to a ten percent and that's what's hitting us going from one uh, 877 to 788 that's that that's that <coughs> that'll hit us next year too because they're I, I still adjusting if you said if it's a two-year trail yeah and they're I, still adjusting for this actual student drop that we have <coughs> which is 756 to 689. Yeah, but I think though this is going to be the worst of it for us because if you look at, again at the pre-K number, we're, we're, we're still going up, right? We're going from 149 to 170, and that's going to be a two-year two statistic. And they're going into the kindergarten, yeah. trans transferring yeah. into kindergarten. But is it point. really that there's more kids in the community, or it's more that we're just counting more kids in a different way? I think we have seen that um, for this year, I don't know if that will be sustained, but for this year, we, we do have more pre-K kids. Now, certainly part of that is because the state is doing it. This is, this is, in, is uh, manifesting what the state has, has wanted, and that is they're saying, hey, uh, the public uh, school district is <coughs> offering a, a voucher for pre-K services, and more people are availing themselves of that. So we still don't know by that number. That really doesn't mean anything about how many no. actual children. That's, it means that yes. there's parents out there that said, wait, there's free money. I can put my kid in a program. Yeah, I don't know, Deb, if you see anything <laughs> yeah, at <I> your <laughs> level. Um, so in order to access Act 166 monies and consequently 
count your children, there are there are requirements that you must meet. You have to have and kids. so, like, you, your teachers have to be at a certain standard, and have license, and that kind of thing. And I think that, um, and, be, and prior to that, Act 62 was doing that to some degree. And so, I think that more programs in the community are, are starting to meet those goals, and consequently, those children can be counted in the totals. But do you see more or less kids, uh, three and four and five year olds, that in terms of just your general sense Population. of, yeah. No, in fact, the um, report that just came out, Howard, Vermont's children and families reported that we have a 2% dip in this. That's what I thought. I thought that mm -hmm. So it's hard to say. It's hard to say. But I, I think that I, I think that, that because there are more, more kids allowed to be counted, we're going to see the worst of this, this uh, dip uh, uh, behind us. I don't think we'll see this kind of a... Uh, gyration up in one year, you know, up 7% in one year and then down 10% the next. I, I think that's the worst of that is over, unless there's another law that the AOE is having. You know, I, I know they're very upfront. The Agency of Ed is very upfront about they've had a very difficult time interpreting the, le the legislation around how, how it was intended to be <coughs> implemented. So thank you very much for this, but there's one more number that I wonder about. And then Todd's got a question. Oh, I'm sorry. He's I didn't that way. So it might not. Um, have you taken the actual expenditure and the actual number, not equalized number, because your final number over here of spending for equalized people still has an equalized number. Can mm -hmm. you do me a spending per pupil, straight on, mm -hmm. no messing? Yeah, we can do that. I, d I just ran out of space on the on the page, but. Um, I, I can do that. I would, I would hesitate um, um, publishing that uh, only because um, I, don't, I don't even know that we want the total pre-K to six. I think we want subtotal K to six. So it's the actual money that's the taxpayer money coming in and the taxpayer because the, the pre-K money well include any pre-K money that we we're actually paying out. Yeah, and so you would want to keep include those numbers because you're you're cutting a check. It's yeah, in the so budget. We're cutting a check. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, no. Yeah. The reason why I, I I think it's good to have that number, and I I used to um, have that as part of a kind of a standard data set um, for school boards to to consider. Um, I I stopped ma making it uh, readily available because no other system. Uh, publishes that number and it's not referred to in the agency of education's website and it's so it would be so easy for that number to be misunderstood where m most of the references that you'll see are that uh, education spending per student and that's a very different number than gross you know gross but but just just so you have a sense of it um, uh, the current numbers that you're looking at right now it would range between uh, 17,200 and uh, um, ooh, and then we go down to <laughs> six, 16,700. We you know we drop precipitously in the fiscal year 18 period. So um, which year are you looking at? The first number is 17. Through yeah. So like fiscal year um, that the first line, the 2013 um, school year, which is the Yep. The uh, fiscal year uh, 14 budget is 17,949, and then, and then the last year, the the, the current, yeah. you know, the proposed year, yeah, exactly, that's all, 16,783. So we are not spending more per person. Well, this is where, that's what you, want. you know, this is where. That's what I want to know. Yeah. But here, here's the here's thing. his disclaimer, Ron. Here's the thing. Uh, in. <laughs> In um, the first year, uh, you were both s s uh, cutting checks for the total amount of special ed services, but you you know. So whole, maybe you can't do this uh, year. Then to do a fair comparison, you have to do last year. Yeah, they're different. They are different um, methodologies. Yeah. Um, I love accounting. Uh, <laughs> fiscal year 17. So the current year is 18,765. Mm -hmm. 
So okay. what approved it? That, student number are you using? Are you using that, a total pre K through six? Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a, a budget of fifteen million nine eighty seven divided by uh, eight hundred fifty two. Yeah, that's what that is. And and it's not a very it's not a good number to to refer to much just because it's <laughs> so out of context with all other statistics that you will see for school. Well, I like Mark's number that he wanted, which was from Andy, or that, you know, that if we can put some figures on, you know, what did we spend 10, 15 years ago in special ed, and what are we doing now? Yeah. How many kids do we have in special ed? Maybe not spending as much as kids. Yeah, not just special ed, but out of school. Out of school, yeah, I haven't Sorry, adjusted school for inflation. Sorry, yeah. yes. Better work. I have to call, call, call Jim back on the, uh, the old I'm sure he would love that. Yeah. It's hard and you're pushing over your... I mean, I could just get a tutor that could help me, but... <laughs> when I <laughs> we have some tutoring programs <laughs> I know, I could access them, but... Frank, in 13, it says 784 equalized pupils, right? Yes. And, and then that number goes into 15382. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so... so so is the 15147 a direct uh, figure of equalized pupils going into the overall budget? Yes. Is that, that, right. it's that straightforward? Yeah. yeah, that yeah. spending per equalized student. Um, is the number of equalized students into the overall budget? Uh, no. Okay, because um, yeah. there's a revenue yeah. component. Because the math doesn't work. Because the 788 yeah. is a That's bigger a number question. going yeah. into a smaller right. number. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was a good question for everyone. Yeah. So, so the so difference what? is the revenue. The, the, so all of that state special ed aid, transportation aid. So that comes off the 15 million. So the budget of 15 million 382 <laughs> is reduced by all of this this revenue. And then you have a net number, which they call education spending, and, like, that's, and that's what's okay. and that's what's in our town reports that okay. three prior year yeah. document. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and that's what everybody goes and glaze. Yeah. <laughs> so do I not need a tutor? Is that what we decided? No, no, you, yeah, you're good. You're good. You you, yeah. you, you, uh, you called it. So the reason that I asked for this and, and um. You know, my, our normal procedure is that whenever we get a question from the public, that I share it with all of you. And actually, in this case, I didn't share it with all of you because it was not just so much a comment, but an actual request for information, which is this. Essentially, I can share the email now if you wish, but I, by the time I was getting this answer, I thought, you know, we should just do it publicly. So I have not forwarded on that email. But it was coming in from the public of, what are you guys crazy? Are you really putting 11%? higher budget per student into are the taxpayers? And, you know, that was the question. I can't possibly fathom how we are spending 11% more per student mm -hmm. to educate our kids. And so we as the board need to be prepared for, you know. We are, we're gonna bring Frank with us. We are. <laughs> well, on a technical, you know, on a technical level, it's, it, is, it is really when you strip away this this um, equalized student count that is that is so uh, inconsistent and so different than our actual count. So that's what's you know those two columns that you have there, the the uh, total pre K, where we we have you know eight fifty seven, eight eight seventy, eight forty seven, eight fifty two, eight fifty nine. You know those are those are how we staff. That's how we staff our building to 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 provide an education. We don't staff based on, you know, this 821, 877, and then 788. That, that's a derivative formula that we have nothing to do with, but it is, it is unfortunately what is um, germane to uh, tax rate calculation. Um, and part of, the, there's part of the answer to this question, Jill, when we're talking about it, we, so we used, the, I think you said 130,000 to, mm -hmm to help relieve this stress right. from this number. Right. So we also didn't staff our buildings last year for 877. That's right. We saved money. <laughs> that was part of the reason we were able to save money. Exactly. And we and we did that. We talked about it openly and we put aside a reserve knowing that that number was inflated. That's right. So uh, that works, my point is that that works both ways. We don't staff the buildings for those numbers when they 
when they don't work in they, our favor and when they do work in our favor, we're, right. it's not as if we're spending extra when it happens the other way. In fact, we're saving for situations like this so we can apply that towards the, the, the stress. <coughs> the other thing I'm passing on is another thing that's in our town report. What, one thing I personally detest is walking up and getting a town report that shows all these numbers that I feel like we're not seeing and unaware of. So as this stuff is going in, I'm making sure that we're all looking at it. And Barb sent this to me today as she was sending it on. This is the numbers that show up in the town report of student numbers. So if somebody's looking at that and wants to look back, this is where our town folks are seeing the census, which is essentially the same thing as what he's got on this yeah, spreadsheet. Yeah, you do but this, just, they should be exact. They should be exact. <laughs> but, but this is the way it shows up in the town report, just so you're prepared and it's going to the printer. And there's, there's um, other things that I forwarded to you, too, that you might want to take a look at, such as how many teachers are in the schools is in the town report, that, that sort of information. So we're prepared again. Yes. The pre-K numbers aren't in the town report? Um, what Barb sent? No, but they may be in another spot that I just didn't pull right there. I, I've got a question on the pre-K numbers. Before he, thinks that the re he thinks the pre-K numbers don't go in the town. Oh, yeah, well, if, if we're not reporting the pre-K numbers, where are the pre-K numbers? Well, I'm talking about what we report to the town. They're reporting them to the Department of Education. We're tracking them at Central Office. She's so I'm, again, I think we keep this in our head as we're thinking about what we're going to share with the town reps. It may be something looks like this, if you all would like. Are there any more questions for um, Frank? Because we normally finish by 7, and that would mean we would be letting Frank go home 17 minutes early. It was really good, Frank. <laughs> That's not early yeah, enough. Yeah, but that's for an equalized business manager. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for taking that. Bye-bye, <laughs> Frank. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Any more questions? We're good? Yes. So I'm going to tick off the principal. So we are at, folks, we are at um, quarter till, and I'd like to have us finish somewhere close to seven. So I'm going to suggest, and see how it goes over, that we jump right down into unfinished business and new business um, and skip any administrative reports. Second. We have. <laughs> <laughs> Since we have a comprehensive written report that was distributed. Right. Thank you. By everybody. Principals have anything that they really needed to, to have us make motions on or any business on? Just, I just wanted to share one thing with you. You don't need to make a motion, but just to alert you that we discovered um, in the last couple of days, we have a, um, a faulty roof that's leaking right now. And um, how many times have we heard? Well, we went to we went to fix it, and um, the the membrane of the roof is so worn that um, the roofer can see through it. So we're going to have to replace it. Um, Isn't that what we've done in different parts of? <coughs> I'm sorry. Haven't we done that in various parts already over the years? Um, there's a lot of roof here. This is over the pantry, and um, there, this roof has not been replaced in my tenure here. So I and I don't know, but unable today to find out when it was last replaced. But that's sort of secondary to the fact that um, it needs to be replaced. Fortunately, it's it's over the pantry. Um, it's small, it's 23 by 23. Um, it should. Be between seven and ten thousand dollars to replace. So we've, we've alerted you that um, it's like that letter, you know, feel not at your peril. We, we're we're going to repair it, replace it um, as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be something exciting, like you found another hidden room underneath the floor <laughs> or something. Like that. Anything else from anybody that has to have action? Gary. Frank, you're supposed to go home. Yep, I'm shut down. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming. We're supposed to be getting it. I really appreciate asking how much one goes on, how much one comes out, because that's a common question. That's mm. so it's hard to find. I and ask all. They go, no, no, we don't want to deal with equations or relativity. We want to know exactly what's going on. So that made a lot of sense, just for, in the in sense of having a good input for our town meeting, meeting mm -hmm. on the same right. table. Thank good. you very much. Yeah. So that brings us to Unfinished Business Act 46 update. <laughs> um, just that um, latest version is on the website, January 26, I believe. 
and uh, we have an information meeting. I'm sorry, Ron, I can't hear you. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> the latest um, articles, X46 articles, are on the website um, dated January 26th. And then we have a um, information meeting in Dummerston related to the Dummerston revote on um, next Monday, February 13th at 6.30. And the vote is the following week on the 21st. It's not, yeah, it's not next Monday. Monday. It's the following Monday. Another whole week to prepare. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And 13th is in Dummerston. Do we have something on the 6th? I don't think so. Do we have anything on the 6th for Nope. No. Yeah. Take that off. Uh, there was no, there's no real substantive changes, although we did have a very heartfelt conversation that if anybody would like to see was, is probably in one of the clearest, most um, direct conversations that we've had with the outlying towns about the needs for, uh, or their fears of a unified board closing a school and how to present that information and the rationales for how we're putting together the articles of agreement. So it's an interesting, perhaps, meeting to watch. Review of the preschool plans and Head Start classrooms with Deb. Um, Deb wasn't here last time, and we got into a bit of a discussion, and the, which Ron was pointing out that the overall goal would be eventually to have all of the classrooms from at least the four-year-old classrooms moving into the schools, the public schools. And then the discussion that we had was pointing out that there's 48 students, roughly, that are four years old. And what would the capacity be in our three grade schools and how that might work. So if you have any comments and anybody else, I'd, I'm wondering, too, if we might see a plan in writing or something so that I understand it better. Maybe. 16 kids per school. So we have 12 children in each of our four Canal Street classrooms for a total of 48, but they are three and fours. Okay. So, so it's not um, 48 four-year-olds. Right. So when we think about that, we think in halves, so 24. And the first step is that we are moving seven of the children in September to a new Oak Grove Collaborative Preschool Head Start program, um, which then would leave us with 17 uh, four-year-olds. And um, that process, I think, is going really well. We've had um, a few meetings, and we um, are at a point where we are actually reaching at EES, we're going to be, I'm going to be holding a meeting for family, families who have children who would be eligible, who would be living in the area and eligible to attend Oak Grove. Um, the classroom would operate uh, following the school year and the school schedule, so we would be closed during school breaks. And we're looking at a school day program at this point. We had some discussion about offering an extended day, but we haven't, we want to take a look at what the needs are of the, of the families first. And um, I would say at the same time, Jerry's having discussion with her preschool families in the neighborhood to determine, um, you know, interest in being in the preschool. We're also, through Janice Stockman, um, alerting the preschool providers of the plans and getting their input as well. So um, I think by, I think we have a meeting next week, we and I think after that we'll have some uh, be able to give you a written summary of, of the process. We're making application. We had uh, we're making application to the state because that's required uh, to, to to have a pre, uh, preschool to have a. Be asked for but the preschool in your building? In oh, built, yes. Okay. And so um, Janice is working um, on that. I think with Deb uh, working on that application, then we're going to that's part of our meeting next week is to kind of review that application and then get it ready to uh, to be sent to the state. So there's you no know, there's steps. I mean, so you know we're all you know hoping that it's uh, will be all ready for. Um, September uh, or really the end of August um, but there are a lot of steps that have to go in uh, certainly um, 
Um, there's money in the budget, but the money ha you know the budget has to be approved. Um, there's application process, so we need uh, approval from from the state. There's families to talk to to find out uh, you know what the interest is in terms of starting. So um, if we have an overwhelming uh, number of families who are interested, you know what kind of um, system will be uh, in place to um, uh, in terms of selection for the students that are enrolled. Okay, and then the Guilford classroom is not Head Start children? Or no, it's it the is. same concept. It's the same concept, same or concept. is it some of the kids that are, are our classrooms now? Uh, yeah, probably not. It, the, 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 the students at Guilford would probably be Head Start eligible students. I wouldn't see the students that are in Canal Street being transported to Guilford. It's almost like what we did in Putney a few years ago. Um, identifying the eligible students in their area along with uh, preschool kids that are not Head Start eligible. And so I'll be really blunt too about the money. The money... They would have to be enrolled in Head Start in order for, to use Head Start money to finance the program. So we have to work through that. Yeah. So, so I still didn't understand. So the money, we have an X amount of funding that comes in now for, for Brattleboro Head Start kids. For X number of children. Right. And we're already always pushing that there's more people that would like to access that than what we have space for. Um, we are uh, seeing a different trend this year in that we are, um, for the first time, we, we don't have a wait list. Um, I think that we're capped out. We have holes or we're equal? We actually have some vacancies and we're um, not filling them as quickly as we have historically. So then for Guilford to start up their preschool, they're putting money in from their own budget? Yep, There's no money coming from our Head Start funding? Um, there could be some funding through Head Start. We'll have to talk about how that would work. And it's not taking away from current students. It isn't? No, it would not be. But I thought we had a maximum amount of money, so where's the money coming? So basically what happens is that when we move children, we have to move staff. And so there has to be enough. So when we're moving seven children to Oak Grove, we are actually closing one Canal Street classroom of 12. And we're just redistributing the remaining five in the existing classrooms. And we are downsizing by basically one teacher position because the funds of the seven children will follow to Oak Grove to finance one of the teaching positions in a team of three. So those are the kinds of things that we have to figure out. And then as we start to transition children out of Canal Street, we also transition money out of Canal Street that keeps the building operating. So those are all things we have to figure out kind of in a strategic plan. Um, that, I all, think that all made sense to me except for the Guilford part. So we're, we're well, I, we haven't got to a point where we can show you that yet. I just wonder if the Guilford voters, when they say, when they're looking at a budget and their, their kindergarten program has money that's designated right now, it says sub slash SU grant for funding that's coming in for their kindergarten. What does that mean? Where does that money come from? Some of it comes from WSESU through uh, um, the, the para support. Um, some of it would come through grant money. Some of it's the local money that they're um, designating. And for us too, then it's the same that we're same putting concept. in some money yeah. from our budget as well. Yeah. There, there are there are many things to consider. Um, and, and I, you know, I want, I, I just want to draw back to the converse, the presentation we had tonight. All of those services that we heard about happen in Head Start. So in this district, they actually happen earlier in kindergarten. And, and those s services, maybe not to the expansive um, amount that we heard, but certainly that that <coughs> whole uh, that whole family services social work approach happens for our Head Start families and the connections in the community and all of those things. And that will follow the seven children that we move to Oak Grove and be extended to the non Head Start children that are in that classroom. So if we, so to Guilford, there, there, there are things, lots of things to consider 
and um, one of the things that we could do possibly based on a conversation I had with the regional office yesterday is that we have um, in so we have Head Start money and we have early Head Start money and those are kind of two different worlds they're now letting us kind of convert and you know shift the slots from one program to the other and we have um, in early Head Start we currently have 40 home based slots and we have been running with 10 under enrolled for lots of reasons, not the least of which is we feel that the opiate addiction crisis in this community is having families keep their doors closed to us and they don't want home visitors. But nonetheless, we have 10 vacancies. And so that, that could equate to a conversion of some sort. So we, we have some permission to be more creative than we have in the past. I just remember when we went through any changes. I, I guess I have two things, yes. three things on my head. And I'm monopolizing the conversation with the board members. The rest of you can have it. But I, I remember preschool conversation and forums and having community members come in and being very concerned about where are we going and how are we going to do that. And so I want to make sure that we're pretty clear here as a board of what that's going to mean. There was concern from the existing providers, and then there was also concern about a large concern about the existing children in Head Start and not having enough slots if we change anything. Mm -hmm. And then the other con other thought that I have is the discussion and the publicity or the public outcry that we had when we were talking about changing, taking transportation away, and making any changes at the Head Start. So to, to go through those changes was a really deliberate process and I don't want us to, to jump ahead. And then my third concern is just that as we go down the road of Act 46 and potentially merging, I don't think anybody's going to accuse me of not trying to think of everybody. And, and I don't want it to seem like I'm belittling Guilford's need. I think Guilford's need is real. But I also think that in case Act 46 doesn't go through, we need to be very clear as to what Guilford's responsibility is going to be in the future if they're continuing with the program. I don't want them to be sold something that yeah, we're definitely all supporting this and it's all because a merger's going through and then all of a sudden uh, it's I, not I, that money. And for us too, we're starting into something, what's it really gonna cost us as we go I, I disagree that this has anything to do with the merger, quite frankly. I, I don't see it. Well, it came up on the, I, the reason I bring it up is it came up on that big chart yeah, and it was something that people at the Guilford Community Forums were really excited about yeah. that this was a program. It was held up to Guilford residents as this is a program that can happen if we do Act 46. Well, so I, it's linked in their minds yeah. from that presentation. I, I think it's a program that would happen without a merger, quite frankly. I just want to be sure we're clear. Yeah. That's all. So do two other board members have any thoughts? I'm sorry. I've had this mulling in my head that I haven't been able to understand it very well for a while. Todd, Mark, Kim, <coughs> you guys are all good. Yeah. Can I clarify something? Mr. Taylor, did you say this is a program that happens without merging? Is that without the, the Act this, 46? This type of uh, preschool blended program in the schools does not require a merger. Okay, great. That's I just right. wanted to be sure. Yeah. Okay. And I'm guessing, and you'll do some written type yep. things as we go forward. Review of preschool behavior discussion between Academy and EES. Deb? Not tonight. Um, any update on that? I don't think there has been any more um, since the last report, which is basically we're doing some cross-visiting. And that's, we're kind of in that place. Anything else to add to that, Andy? We haven't gotten up there. I don't think we are. I mean, I think, frankly, it's, it's not going to happen. So how about if we leave this on for yet another time and we'll check back in at the next meeting to see if anything's happening. Does it seem like it had some support? We'll move that forward. Update on concern from St. Michael's School as to their ability to qualify for universal meals. We have a meeting scheduled for February 9th. Frank and I will be meeting with the people at St. Michael's. New business. Anything else on under unfinished? Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, 
I've got the school impact questionnaire that I, I just need approval from the board. It's the Lamplighter Motel oh, yeah, being converted to um, um, low cost housing. housing. And um, there is no significant impact to your district. So I just need a motion to authorize me to sign off on that um, initiative. Can we make a motion to that effect? So moved. I'll make a That's the one on uh, Putney Road? Yeah, right past, past uh, Traffic Street. Uh, Panda North. That's our involvement. If every time something like that comes up, then it has to go out to the various organizations like schools to have any opinion and statements on it if right, we wanted. Change. Yeah, any new housing, they want to make sure that there's no negative impact to the school system. So we have to. Other weird things come forward too, like once a rooster was coming into the Green Street School area, we had to discuss that. Mm -hmm. What? Is that true? Right? So Kim made a motion. Mark was seconding. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. SU board meeting February 15th. I think we're going to try to do it in one of the Brattleboro schools. Um, it'll be at 630. Um, and the SU Finance Committee, I think we're going to try to meet at 6 that night on the 15th. So that would be Mark. I have that, that, it, that it's in the Cusick room. Uh, it's not available. Okay. Yeah, we'll get it. And I have it at 6. We're now at 6.30. Okay. Is there a school board? Is there a school board meeting that night at 5? No. Um, you're not scheduled for a meeting uh, fe February 15th. 1-5, uh, you said? 2-5. Two, 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 five. Five. Two. Two five. Two five. Oh, that's why I have two five. I have one five. I'm talking about February fifteenth. I'm talking about one five would be January fifteenth. Oh, sorry. Two fifteenth. Yeah. February fifteenth. Two slash fifteenth. One five. Not one. Not January fifth. The fifteenth of February. Ah. Fifteenth February. I was really confused. Exactly. So six thirty. Su board reps. And six o'clock will be finance with Mark. All right. Okay. And we just don't know where yet. Uh, one of the Brattleboro Town Schools. We're gonna leave it to the principals to fight over. Uh, to be determined. Jill, what's our next school board? So our next school board meeting is not till March first, right? Right. That's correct. And so March first is when we're gonna plan for the town rep meeting because the following week will be, or two weeks later, will be the town rep meeting. Okay. So, review of the warning articles. That's what these are. I don't have copies, oh, but I have just oh, the final okay. copy to be signed. Okay, so <coughs> one, of the, one of the things that we have to do officially is approve that these are the articles. So, I'll read it out loud for you guys so we all know. I think I can skip that, right? Article 1, to choose all town officers, town school district members, and Brattleboro Union High School District directors required by law to be elected at the annual meeting. Also to be elected under this article are town meeting members from the following districts. District 1, 16 members for, is this really the right thing I'm reading? No, that's, no, that's no, the that's town. Yeah, this is not us. Never mind. Well, this is the old it's total one, but we don't have yeah. uh, right That's not us to approve, right? Starting to see what salaries the town school district will pay its school board members, that's Article 1. I'm going to read all of them, then we can take one motion on all of them. Article 2 is to see if the town school district will authorize its town school directors to borrow money in anticipation of taxes. 3, to see if the town school district will authorize the district to accept and expend categorical grants and aid received from the state of Vermont and the U.S. government. Article 4, shall general obligation bonds or notes of the Brattleboro Town School District in an amount not to exceed $350,000, subject to a reduction from future state and federal grants in aid and the application of future reserves, payable over a term not to exceed 10 years, be issued for the purpose of making heating system improvements to the Green Street School, the estimated cost of such improvements being $946,000. This article shall be voted on upon by Australian ballot. Just a note that I tried to make that wording less wieldy, and apparently the lawyers don't like any changes, so that's it. <laughs> shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $14,547,425, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year? 
It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $16,960 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 10.9% higher than spending for the current <coughs> year. Thus, our discussion earlier, this is the wording that is mandated by law. It has to be in there that way. Right. So this is where folks are going to go, wait a minute. And we well, that's where you say, it. Frank, take over. <laughs> right. Article 6, to act on the auditor's report. Article 7, to see if the town and town school district will authorize its select board and school directors to employ a certified public accountant. To Article 8, to see if the town will ratify, approve, and confirm the select board's approval of the town. So that, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah. No worries. No worries. So, is there a motion to approve that? Yeah, at, we'll motion first and then we so can move. Moved. Second? Second. Now, a discussion. That's not new. We've always used that language around. Last year it was new. It was new that around the right. saying what we're spending. For what we're saying. Yeah. It was last year. It was, and it was part of the state trying to make voters aware that there Last year we had the inflated numbers. So right. So, it, yeah. Yes. It looked good. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> Any more discussion? All in favor of these articles being warned? Aye. 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 So now, Dave <coughs> School's very worried that we have um, an article on the agenda for discussing Act 46. And I also was approached by at least one town person at the last Act 46 meeting. And I asked then. I don't know how these things happen. So, and they are, Act 46 is on the agenda for Guilford, Putney, and for, um, what's the one I'm missing? Putney, Demerson, Guilford. So here's some possible wording. Well, let me just yeah. um, point out, those other towns, Demerson is different language. Um, in Guilford and Putney are identical to this, but those were petitions that were signed by 5% of their voters. There were no petitions in Brattleboro to do this. But if you wanted to have this discussion, I would say... Hold on, i got to leave this thing here. Well, I, I know that's what I'm referring to. You've got this? Yeah. Okay. So I, I would be saying, just like at the break of your seventh article or sixth article before they get into town business, I would not wait until other at the end of article 23. The moderator would allow you to have discussion on this topic. It, it's, this is not consistent with what you need to do because in this case it's the voters who request the Act 46 study committee. I don't know that the study committee is going to be at your representative town meeting. So you might want to change this, but this is just an example of what the petition language was. So to give the town reps a uh, report by the school board or the Act 46 members of the school board would be germane during other. And that's what I would be recommending. And to further on that, I asked the town manager and Bob Fisher, the town lawyer, was there. And he said that um, if if the article is simply to discuss Act 46 without any action to be taken, the Brattleboro Charter prohibits such an article. So we would not need to write an article to say we are definitely discussing Act 46. He said that um, if the board wishes to warn an article upon which an action will be taken, which is in this that they're actually requesting some report back, is that what the action is? I, no, I mean, I, I think it's a brief report outlining the pros and cons of the merger and the alternatives to the merger, that last bullet. So it's not action. It, well, the action is to give a report. Mm -hmm. So then that's not legal, according to Bob, what these guys have done. Mm -hmm. he, he, said that, um, he said if the board wishes to warn an article upon which an action will be taken, then such an article may pass the requirements of the charter. Since he's not seen the proposed wording, he can't give an opinion. Um, in a nutshell, if it's for the discussion purposes only, he stands by discussing it under other business. Mm -hmm. If it's for taking a specific action, then create an article and he would review it. He also said earlier that if, if it's um, germane to the budget, he said an Act 46 could be discussed 
to the extent the moderator deems the discussion germane to the budget, we can do it under the school's budget article, which is what Ron was referring to. If the moderator determines that it's not germane to the budget, then it would be discussed under other business at the end of the meeting. And Dave's concern was that people by other business don't have any mental cap. To, okay, quite time. frankly, I think in the past we've asked the moderator to bump our stuff up if we we're in the morning to do other right after our budget discussion. They've always accommodated that. In, in the action, it's, they're not, you're not asking the town reps to take action, you're just informing them of this. Mm -hmm. So there is no action that, that Bob's referring to. So therefore, the answer, that what Ron's saying, what Bob's saying is that it's other. days discussion or asking to actually have it be on the agenda is not going to happen as a warned right. article right. and and also they would somebody would have had to have done that by the deadline this week which is passed so yeah. and the petition was supposed would have to have been in January 19th and yeah. it wasn't a petition so I would say we could rework this language where you give some information under other do we even need to have a warning go under other? We just, he said we don't do a warning. So no, no, I, no, you can't do it as a warning. Yeah. I, I was just thinking uh, as a document to pass out oh, if, okay. if you needed to. I don't think you need to. But, I don't know what we do. Yeah. So are we comfortable with that, that Act 46 discussion will encourage that and ask for the town moderator to put us as an yeah, other sure. and during yeah, our right. budget? Sure. Yes. In which case, it yes. pushes us to the end. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sorry. That's making this meeting go on for forever. All right, so that leaves planning for the town representative meeting and the community forum that can be done in the first meeting in March okay. yes yes can we signature yes I say do we need to sign anything I'll sign. for the but I, I think we're okay unless there's anything else for the next agenda item board members anything yeah. for the next agenda principals who come and just sat through this meeting roughly instead of talking <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. nothing else all right, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes, thank you. Here we go.